Tim McKernan live from the Car Shield Studio on 101 ESPN. Howdy, friends. It's Josh Rocchio. We're in for the balloon party. It's good to be with you guys. Here, lift up the camera. They're looking at my cans. They're looking at my breast, my bosom. They're looking at my NWO sweatshirt for life. You ready for the? Uh, you ready for Mania this weekend? Is it in town? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. No. Oh, wait, no. That's not, that's the one event St. Louis doesn't get. St. Louis gets. I uh, know because uh, what was it last year? Two years ago? Was it the Rumble that was here? Yeah, St. Louis gets the Rumble and SummerSlam, the other big one. And, I, but but it never gets WrestleMania. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. I went to SummerSlam in uh, Nashville like two years ago. I really hate wrestling events in stadiums. They're stupid. I hate really going to anything that isn't a football game in a football stadium. It's dumb. Like concerts are terrible. Like uh, I went to see uh, the Motley Crue and Def Leppard tour a couple years ago in Nashville. And and even when you're in the lower bowl seats, you feel like you're miles away from everything. You're not even part of it. I don't like it. So, but my wife is really into wrestling. I mentioned this in the uh, chat on YouTube yesterday, and someone's like, well, it sounds like you got yourself a good woman. I'm like, no, it sounds like I'm married to a loser is actually what it sounds like, but she's nice and I love her. So well, you know, I'm married to a shoot, dork. Shoot at the targets you got. <laughs> yeah. I come from a long line of wrestling consumers because my grandma <laughs> Edna was really into wrestling. She'd drive up to St. Louis from Poplar Bluff, and she'd go, she, she's, oh, so we're going to the Checker Dome. She'd go see wrestling there. She'd go see it at Keel. She'd go see it at Chase. She didn't care she would always go see wrestling so now as a kid i'd go see wrestling with my grandma everywhere i lived she loved wrestling loved ted dibiase that's her favorite wrestler of all time goldberg and ted dibiase but she couldn't pronounce his name she'd say say grandma who's your favorite wrestler she'd say ted dibiase I'd say, well, that's good, Grandma. So then my mom used to make fun of me and my grandma when I was really into wrestling, NWO for life. Like, it was WCW, Monday Night War, when you're NWO, you're too sweet for life, all that. My mom would mock me and my grandma for being so into wrestling. Fast forward about 20 years, my mother and my wife text each other about wrestling, all the time. Told my mom that sometimes I park my car down here and Randy Orton, the Viper, Randy Orton is getting out of his car to go ride a stationary bicycle down at this place down here. And I say, I, I see him and she's like, did you talk to him? I'm like, no, I'm not going to walk up to Randy Orton and be like, first of all, what do you say to wrestlers when you meet them? Do you talk to them like they're their character or do you talk to them like they're just a normal human? That's a good point. It's really tough, man. Because like. Depends if they're retired or not. Because like I was watching Joe Rogan and interview Hulk Hogan. He didn't call him Terry. He calls him Hulk Hogan. But when Hulk Hogan's on the stand facing Gawker in a trial, he says, no, I'm Terry. Hulk Hogan is a character I play. Then what do I call you? Who are you? I met Ric Flair when I was a kid. I, he was at a radio station my dad worked at, and Ric Flair and Arn Anderson came up to the uh, uh, radio station. And I took a picture with him. I threw up the four horsemen with him. This is like a 97, so Flair's got like the short blonde hair cut. And Arn Anderson's probably only 25, but he looks like he's 60 because that's always been Arn Anderson. I have to apologize to all the wrestling fans. Um, apparently, St. Louis gets Survivor Series. Oh, not okay. I knew Survivor there was, there's two S's in there and just how dare I. Yes, that's you messed up. I haven't, I'm sorry. I, I, I haven't watched since the five-star frog splash by RVD was a big move. Oh, you like Rob Van Dam? I'm not saying I liked him. I'm saying that's what it was a big move when I last time I watched. Uh, I hated ECW. Because he like, listen, I'm not like some this prude like or anything. Up to a uh, to a to a pivot where you talk about how last night's game was scripted or something. No, oh, okay. no, I'm actually in a very good mood about sports right now. We're doing well, okay. so now don't judge me. Shut your hole. Only God and the chat can judge me. But let me tell you something. <laughs> ECW was gross. And it was bloody, and it was trashy, and I didn't like it. And I will leave it at that. I thought it was disgusting. It was very Philadelphia, and that's where it took place was in Philadelphia. So it made sense because Philadelphia is gross and disgusting and trashy. <laughs> now, to more important things that are not wrestling related. I think we're back. I think we're back, Rock. I have watched now two games of baseball, and on the inside, I feel really, really, really good. And, hey, we may not go to the World Series, and we may not go to the playoffs, but I'm going to tell you something that makes me happy as I sit here today at, uh, what time is it, 10.07 on the whatever day of the year this is, April whatever, 4th, 5th, whatever day it is. 
I am. It's a line of demarcation. This is a let's say the third April third. Thank you. Appreciate it. It is April third. Do you want me to do a time check? That's our Clarkson Jewelers time check. Thank you. I appreciate it. I wasn't sure you were just pointing at the screen like this. I was like, oh, okay, my bad. We trying, don't do time checks over to, on Casey. I was trying to raise John Rondo it for it, you. Thank you. We don't do time checks over there. But let me tell you this. We're back. And I sit here last night and the last two nights watching the Cardinals play baseball, and they are doing things that last year's Cardinal team didn't do. Notably stopping the other team from getting on base as often. And when they get on base, they stop them from scoring. That is something we did not do last year. We have had back-to-back -back quality starts. And we've got a special little spark plug that wears number 11. And he is not the secret weapon, Jose Okendo, but he is the new secret weapon. His name is Victor Scott II. And this guy, when I watch him run the bases... I'm like Ricky Bobby because I'm getting to drive a race car. I got a chubby right now because I'm getting to drive a race car. That's me when I watch Victor Scott play baseball. We're not kicking the ball around. We're getting quality starts out of people. We're still not totally getting all the big hits, you know. We're scoring runs by, you know, hit batters and balks and catcher's interferences and little dribblers because the catcher doesn't touch uh, the plate. Does not matter. The last two nights have resurrected my belief that this summer may not be a cruel, 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 cruel summer. And that makes me happy today. I am excited to talk about baseball today. I am excited to talk about the fact that Victor Scott can run for days and days and days. I'm excited to talk about the fact that maybe Mason Wynn can get some big knocks. And I'm excited about the fact that the St. Louis Cardinals at least appear to be playing professional baseball, which is what they were not doing last year. And as a diehard fan who had to sit through that misery of last year, it is nice to come on the radio and fill in for Tim McKernan and Action Jackson today and say, I've enjoyed watching the Cardinals play baseball the last two days. May not last forever. My bad mood may come today. We may lose 10 nothing today, and all of that will be erased in my mind because I am a psycho. I am like, that's what I try to explain to people. If I'm passionate about something, you'll know it because I'm a psycho about it. I wasn't passionate about stuff when I was on the radio in Philly. So I could come in and be radio guy in Philly and tell you like the, the radio stuff you needed to hear, right? That's what I did when I was on the radio in cities that I didn't care about the teams. I had to feign passion. You will know I am passionate when one minute we're going to the World Series and the next minute we're the worst team in baseball and everyone should be fired. Can I, can I pinpoint that minute and predict your reaction? Yes. So I'm going to go with about, let's, let's say I'm going to go with 3.37 p.m. and let's call it Friday, April, <laughs> Friday, April 19th, let's call it. So that's two and a half weeks from okay. now. 3.37 p.m., Friday, April 18th. It comes across the board. Do, 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 yeah. Cardinals have activated outfielder Lars Nupar and assigned Victor Scott II to Memphis. Then what's your reaction? <laughs> then I will be like everybody on Twitter who says we are not a real baseball organization. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's focus on Victor Scott for Let's a second. It. When is the last time the St. Louis Cardinals had a player that when he got on base, you were excited to see what he was going to do? I'll tell you the answer. It's been since before I was born. I was born in 1986. So Vince Coleman, when Vince Coleman came up in 1985, I wasn't even alive for it, but I'm such an addict that I've watched heck of a year, the 1985 Cardinals season highlight video 30,000 times in my life that I remember vividly hearing Dow Maxville, the general manager of the Cardinals, say, well, you know, Vince, you're just going to stay down here for a couple games until Willie's back. And then when Willie's back, we're going to send you down. You're going to get your work. And he said, I get that, Mr. Maxville, but guess what? I'm going to be here for the whole year. And I said, well, I like you being confident, but just know that when Willie comes back, we're sitting you down, and Vince says, nope, I'm going to be here the whole year. That is the closest thing we've had. I had that talk with BK a couple weeks ago. Maybe Ray Langford, but that's even a different scenario. We have not had a guy who's essentially like a Billy Hamilton at this point. You don't know what you're going to get out of him offensively, although from what I've seen, I believe he has the capability of being a better offensive player than a Billy Hamilton. I think he is equal speed, if not not faster Billy Hamilton, who can play a better outfield than Billy Hamilton, and oh, by the way, gives you the threat of hitting that Billy Hamilton did not give you. Yet somehow we're debating whether or not he should be sent down because, well, you know, we got to get Alec, Alec Burleson some shot off the bench. He sucks. Can someone say that Alec Burleson sucks? 
Like, can we do that? Like, I, I look, BK is my, he's my dog. I ride with those dogs, okay? I do. But, like, he really is into this, this Alec Burleson. And I'm like, and not in the sense that he wants him over Victor Scott. We are part of, we are Scott's tots. So we are in this, okay? <laughs> like, we are, Vic, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that works better than stealing it from the office. And much like late in that situation, it's going to get cringy at some point. It will. But this is Scott's tots. Me and BK are Scott's tots. And I hear them talking about this guy, and I'm like, what is it that Alec Burleson does? He's a lumbering, thick outfielder that seemingly can't hit. What will he do for you? Like, even in a day that Victor Scott's not in the lineup, which, oh, by the way, he should be in the lineup every day. Why should he be in the lineup every day? Because your defense is part of the reason why you're winning these ball games, and he plays a sick, disgusting, glorious outfield. He glides out there. He looks like Matthew McConaughey when the, the angel came down for the first time and angels in the outfield, and he flies. He flies, and I'm like, this is beautiful. This is baseball like it ought to be, baby. This is 1996 Cardinals team slogan. This is baseball like it ought to be. Dudes playing defense, dudes stealing bases, get them on, get them over, get them in. That's baseball, man. Baseball's not sitting around for some pud to hit a three-run home run and go one for five and bat 190. That ain't baseball, baby. Baseball is get them on, get them over, get them in, win ball games. Because if we're waiting for people to hit home runs, I'm going to tell you who's not going to. <laughs> Goldschmidt and Arenado. I'm ready to put those cats out to pasture. I don't know how you feel about it, but, like, I hate watching them come up. It bothers me. Because what we have here is potential. You've got a lot of these younger dudes. Now, maybe Wynn will never amount to an offensive player. I don't know. Maybe Victor Scott will fall off a cliff. I don't know. I didn't mean that literally. I meant like figuratively, not like the dude who drove off the cliff, not like Oscar Tavares. It was more of a, I did not mean it literally is all I'm saying. It was a figure of speech. Maybe his game will fall off a cliff. But all that said, I watched the two big money veterans come up there and I'm like, I would rather have Victor Scott at the plate than Nolan Arenado right now. I'd rather have Mason win at the plate. The Nolan Arnold. Base is loaded, nobody out. Chance to blow the game open. You hit a ball seven miles per hour off the bat, and the only reason we get a run out of that is because the catcher's a dummy? Let me turn the screw a little bit. The potential, the reported Nolan Arenado trade to the Dodgers that didn't happen last year, the pitcher that would have been coming to the St. Louis Cardinals mm -hmm. would have been Bobby Miller, who, if you remember the name, it's because he absolutely blitzed through the Cardinals lineup like four different, uh, three different, three and a half times yeah. uh, in the second game of the, uh, of, of the season. So let's just, you know, pour a little salt in that yeah, room for you. I mean, it's easy to look back on trades that did and didn't happen. Like, I don't like when people do that. It's easy to do. Like when people say, oh my God, I can't believe we traded this guy for Ozuna. Well, Ozuna, first of all, outside of, you know, gifts excluded where he's climbing the wall for a ball that's 290 feet, gifts excluded, the guy was the guy you needed to go get in that situation. I think a lot of people like to play revisionist history when it comes to trades, and it's fun to do that, especially when the team stinks and you had a worst season you've ever had and you're watching dudes you let go do big things. I get all that, but that's over. That's over now, and you're stuck with Arenado. So what are you going to do? Like, dude, like he doesn't even look like he's interested in baseball. Like, he looks broken. Like, and I'm not saying that for effect, or I'm not saying that, like, to, to be wacky. Arenado looks broken. And then Goldschmidt just looks kind of old. Like, you can never really get a read on Goldschmidt. He looks like, he looks uninterested. He looks like an investment banker all the time. He never shows joy. He's like a tax man. He just sits there, no look on his face. He's just filled, doing your, he works at H&R Block, and he's just, like, filling out your stuff. He's, second McConaughey reference. Yeah, he, he, there you go. He's like your CPA. You know, he's a boring person. Like, there's nothing interesting about either one of these guys. But Arenado seems broken. There's something wrong with him. And I can't figure it out. I don't know what it is, but, like, he ain't right. All that said, we're back. This is good. We're playing baseball. I, look, I stayed up, watched both of those damn games, first pitch to the end of it, and I loved it because I feel different. And if you guys want to get in, you can text. All right, text in 314-399-9646. That's the Air Comfort uh, Service text line. Like, look, you could say I'm overreacting because I do that a lot. We suck one minute, we're great the next. That's the Josh Ennis way. I am a lunatic, and I understand that. But I feel like when you watch the Cardinals play, especially these last two games, you go, this is at least different.
than it was last year. Last year felt like it was a snowball and it was just going and it was never going to stop. And before you know it, you've lost like nine out of 10 and the season's over. This doesn't feel like that. But I do reserve the right if we lose 10 nothing today to change my opinion when I come back on Friday. All right, we're in for a balloon party. It's Josh and Rock. It's uh, E101 ESPN. See that uh, Stephon Diggs got traded to the Texans for draft pick compensation. 
He's a total hard-on, seemingly, but you know what? Maybe if he's not having to catch passes from Josh Allen anymore, maybe he'll be happy. And or I, he might break um, C.J. Stroud. I don't know. Is, is, I didn't see this last night at all, but Robert Griffin III had tweeted out a video uh, that he had done. Um, the title was, Is Stephen Diggs Essential to Josh Allen's Success? A Twitter user responded to Robert Griffin's post and said, Does Josh benefit from having a top-tier receiver? Yes. Is he essential to his, his, his success? No. Stephen Diggs last night responded to that with, You sure? Question mark. <laughs> and then... Less than, I guess, even like 12 hours later, he has been moved. He, um, I don't like him per se because he seems dickish and diva-ish. And that leads me down the road of one of my favorite. Hold on a second. Mm Mm-hmm. On wide re- relative on wide receiver on the wide receiver scale or just the player scale. Well, if the wide receiver scale is at the very low end, you've got like a Larry Fitzgerald who yes. seems to never bitch who just does everything. He's at the very bottom, and at the top, it's like To yeah. threatening to kill himself while yes. doing push-ups in his driveway. Yes. I'd say he is. He's above average. Okay. So that's he's fair. like a six. Yeah, that's fair. But, like, he's always seems – he just seems to be bitching. Josh Allen doesn't suck. Like, there are far worse quarterbacks one could play with than Josh Allen. Allen is a reckless player at times and finds ways to lose. Sometimes it's his fault. Sometimes it's not. See missed kicks and all that. I, I Here's a, a, a hot sports take. I am of the belief – that some people are just losers. And I don't mean that like they're bad people or they're deadbeats or they beat their kids or anything. When I say that some people are winners by the very definition of I win sports games versus I lose sports games, Josh Allen is a loser. Seems like a decent guy. You know that he, uh, he uh, poontangs around with that Haley Steinfeld, too. That's his lady. See, people don't talk about that. They all talk about who's banging Taylor. But he's actually with Haley Steinfeld, who had a moment. She had a, cu- a couple songs. She was in that I movie. I love Haley Steinfeld. Yeah. She, she was she's in the adorable. Pitch Perfect, and uh, she was in that movie with Woody Harrelson where she's kind of like a weird, troubled teen, and he's the teacher. It's called Ed- Edge of 17, maybe. So no one talks about that, but that's neither here nor there. But when you look at it, you go, some people just won't win. Like, they're either cursed, they're snake bit, whatever way you want to put it. That is Josh Allen. He will never win. And part of it's because you've got Patrick Mahomes on the other side, who is just a winner. Somehow people win. You could say, and he's also got Andy Reid, who is just a winner. Oh, contraire, mon frere. Andy Reid was not a winner until Andy Reid had Patrick Mahomes, who is a winner. You got to have those guys, you know? Andy Reid was a great coach before he had Patrick Mahomes. He's a Super Bowl winning coach now because he has Patrick Mahomes. Some people are winners. Some people are losers. And I believe that C.J. Stroud is a winner. And this comes from someone who lived in Houston during the golden era of Gary Kubiak and Matt Schaub. So I know winning football. I know of which I speak. You also know pick sixes. Oh, I do, man. That was quite a year in 2013, like five games in a row of the pick six. It was a good time. My wife is a big Texans fan, so she uh, she really gets into it. I am a Saints fan, so I got Derek Carr. What do you want from me? Like, God hates me. So, I don't know, I did Dennis Allen and then Derek Carr. He's like, oh, you like football? You won't for very much longer. <laughs> I was like, oh, you like Drew Brees? Watch this. Uh, but... Um, but just from a football standpoint, that's a giant weapon. I mean, dude, did you see what C.J. Stroud was doing with no-name dudes? Like just th- like Tank Dell? Like no one in the world had ever heard of Tank Dell, and Tank Dell's catching like 75-yard touchdown passes. Like C.J. Stroud is him. He is that dude. And it's weird to say that about the Texans because, like, I bang on Matt Schaub. Matt Schaub didn't suck. Like, at his best, Matt Schaub was probably a top 10 quarterback in the league because, for the most part, there were, like, 10 good quarterbacks and there were a lot of stiffs. But Matt Schaub was a top 10-level quarterback at his best. He was a Pro Bowl alternate, had, I think, a 4,700-yard season. He had Andre Johnson. He would connect. And Gary Kubiak's offense was electric when it was going and Arian Foster and all that. So, like, I don't think Schaub sucked. It's just easy to make fun of him after the fact. But the Texans have never had someone like that. C.J. Stroud is going to be a top five quarterback, if not top three quarterback in the league. Uh, does this... Is this... I mean, are the Texans the third best team in the AFC? Is it? Is it? Is it Chiefs? Well, Ravens? we always pencil the Chiefs, Chiefs in because Chiefs, they find a way. Chiefs, Ravens, Texans? 
I'm just thinking, you know, dude, quality of overall roster. Are the Texans better than the Ravens? But the Ravens, they're also just kind of losers. Like, they don't win. They don't win it. And that's what I'm saying is overall quality of roster, Houston might have the second best roster in the AFC right now. Yeah. That's and insane. They got a very good coach. Like, like this is so wild to say because as someone who spent so much time in Houston with them being kind of a joke and, like, the owner was kind of a goof and the 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 coach, it was Kubiak, and they all loved him because he's a Texas guy, but, like, nothing ever really worked out. It's weird to say it, but the Texans, in, like, a weird accidental way have almost gumped themselves into being an elite franchise and they got a really hot lady owner which does not happen outside of Rachel Phelps like Rachel Phelps is the last really hot lady owner we've had in sports and she wasn't I real won't, I won't see you walk into St. Louis and disparage Georgia like that oh how she's hot you. how okay. dare you how she, dare you listen she's a coog. I like her but have you ever seen uh, Hannah McNair? Have you Google Hannah McNair? Oh, no. Just that's the owner of the tech. She's hot. Like you're laughing. Like the, I would uh, lead you astray. I'm not sending you to Pornhub. I got your beat. I got your beat. Uh, Mallory Eden. Oh, who, who's that? She's the daughter of the Bucks owners, and she was dating Aaron Rodgers for a little bit. Oh yeah, that chick. Oh wait a second. I take it back. What's her name? The the one chick that's married to the 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 Hawks owner. Uh, what's her name? The, we got cows from Twister. What's her name from uh, Less Than Zero? Who am I thinking of? The the broad from Less Than Zero. The a hot '80s broad from Less Than Zero. Helen Hunt? No. no. No! That was, that was writers. Who said Helen Hunt? Jamie Gertz? Yes, Jamie Gertz. Helen Hunt. You said twister. Yeah, it's like, I like chicks that look like catcher's mitts. Oh, no. What are you talking about? It Helen been, Hunt. It could have been Sarah Buxton. Helen Hunt. Go home. <laughs> that's what they should have told Chip Carey last night. That's what they should tell you, Ryder. Go home. <laughs> Helen Hunt. Helen Hunt. It's not your day. <laughs> Helen Hunt. By the way, I also want to point out earlier in this show, uh, Josh mentioned Matthew McConaughey being an Angels in the outfield. If you knew that, go to more trivia nights, bet more money on Everyone random knows stuff. That. I, I, could, I, I would not have remembered Matthew McConaughey in Angels in the outfield at all. He's I, literally the first guy that got angeled. I, I, I was like 10 <laughs> last time I saw it, so it's been a while, but that's a great six degrees of separation move. I like that. I we, think we, he was the first guy got, that got angeled. We got... Whoever this woman is from Twister against. That's Jamie Gertz. Jamie, we got Jamie Gertz. But look at Jamie Gertz now. Not in Twister, because they made her look all weird in Twister because she was like the straight lace person in Twister. Oh, now I know who this is. She, remember, she yes. was at the, she's at the draft lottery every yes, year. Yes, yes, so that's yes. Jamie Gertz. Oh, she's a hot 80s chick, and she's even hotter on a TV show called Not Still Standing. That's the one with Tim Allen, right? But there was another show where it's like those 2000 sitcoms. So there's the fat oaf, and she's the hot wife. What was that damn show? Uh, the, the Neighbors? No, I don't know the hell that is. But Jamie Gertz, hot 80s broad, and she's an owner, too. So, but still, all, have you looked up Hannah McNair yet? Oh, no, this no, is no, important. No. And I'll get back to hot Victor Scott takes. If you just tuned in, you're like, this guy doesn't talk sports. I gave you like 15 minutes of good Victor Scott conversation, so don't come at me. Oh, yeah, she looks like she'd Dude, yell at you. I know, but like in a sexual manner. Like, she looks like she'd be able to do those kind of erotic videos where, like, she talks about how small your pee-pee is, and you're like, I like it. You ever watch those? Did Tim, did Tim like, feed you that line for this for today's show? No, oh, no, but I, that makes sense because they talk about those kind of things. Huh? <laughs> I just, we're, They're we're smutty. Getting, we're getting the original, the original balloon party going here today. It's smutty. We do smut conversation here. But, yeah, Hannah McNair is so hot. And then you look at her husband, who looks like Big Enos Burdett from Smokey and the Bandit, and you're like, that guy's getting laid because he's rich. 309's mad at us for not mentioning Jeannie Buss. That's a good point. Oh, yeah. Take that back, too. And she saved uh, what's his name's life. Basically, she's married to uh, Jay Moore, who was like all hopped up on pills and everything. Uh, you know, of course, most people know him as Bob Sugar. I know him as my sort of coworker I, when I we miss, were both fill-ins on the Jim Rome. Show. I miss early two thousands when Jay Moore would pop up in random TV shows a lot. He would, and he was on like, a lot so of much. sports stuff because he had a sports talk show, and he was also a fill-in on the Jim Rome show, like the Sklar Brothers. Oh, the Sklar Brothers, the Sklar, Louis, of course, STL, baby. The Sklars, Jay Moore. Fantastic. And Josh Ennis, three regular fill-ins on the Jim Rome Show. And now I'm getting yelled at by people on the 101 ESPN YouTube channel. So I've, uh, I've ascended. <laughs> We're back after this.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Cardinals yesterday with a 5 2 win over the Padres. They will go for the sweep today against the Padres with a game 3, a 3 10 first pitch. It'll be Zach Thompson 0 1 on the season with an 8.44 ERA facing off against Joe Musgrove on the season 0 1 with a 9.72 ERA. Blues are back in action tomorrow facing off against the Predators. You hear the game right here in your home for the St. Louis Blues 101 ESPN starting with our 6 p.m. pregame. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga. Uh, heating and cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. I like how um, Ryder brought me into the room in there to show me pictures of Helen Hunt to try to convince me that his take of who's the hot chick that was in Twister? Oh, yeah, Helen Hunt <laughs> was a good take. <laughs> it was not a good take at all. Uh, but sometimes you just need to go home. Like, that's what happened with Chip Carey last night. Like, look, I have been a broadcaster for many, many years. This might shock you, but I have been a broadcaster for a long time, since I was 14 years old, actually. The first job I had was that of a play-by... This is going to shock you. I was a play-by-play announcer for a minor league hockey team. So they were in Baton Rouge, double-A team. So they were, I mean, they weren't like some, like, you know, little tiny team. They were a double-A affiliate type of hockey team, ECHL, the East Coast Hockey League. Baton Rouge Kingfish. Played teams like the Macon Whoopi and the Pensacola Ice Pilots and the Mobile Mystics and teams like that. And I was 14, and my dad was on the radio, and I guess they were just looking for anything to drum up some attention. So they were like, my dad was like, hey, can my kid try to do play-by-play? He wants to be a play-by-play announcer. They said, well, have him do a demo for us. So I grabbed, like, NHL 20, like, 2001, put it in the PlayStation, let the computer play it, and I called the game into a, a tape recorder and gave it to the team. And they said, all right, you want to do the second period of our games? I'm like, like, like talk? And they're like, yeah, play-by-play. I'm like, oh, okay, and then I just did it, you know? And I did that for a couple years. I did baseball play-by-play when I was a teenager for an independent league team. Uh, That serves two purposes. One, to brag about my young man resume, but two, to let you know that, like, I was 14 and I was at least able to passably do this. Why did I tell you this? Because anybody could have stepped into the booth last night and at least had a voice for nine innings. Now, you could say, Josh, who do you blame for this Chip Carey voice debacle? Well, Chip has now been here for one full season and six games, right? This happened last year, if you'll recall. Guy lost his voice on a broadcast last year, so obviously he's got issues. But whose fault is it that we, the consumers of the product, had to listen to a guy struggle to breathe for nine innings? Is it the broadcast itself for not having somebody on standby to say, hey, come do this? Or is it Chip Carey for not having the wherewithal to say, or really I'd say the good sense to say, listen, guys, I'm only making my situation worse. I'm going to sit this one out. They're both at fault. But let me ask you this, because you do play-by-play stuff, right, Rocky? You've done, uh, what, do you like lacrosse or something? I've done, yeah, I've done a bunch of, I have done lacrosse, done soccer, baseball, football, hockey. Okay. Yeah. Neither one of us are Jack Buck here. Like, I don't have the pipes for that. Like, that's why I got out of trying to be a play-by-play guy, because there's no money in it, and I don't have the voice for it. And, uh, well, mostly there was no money in it. I could have faked the voice. Hello. I could have been John Rooney. Oh, it would have been fine. But in that scenario, like, let's say this is the movie Airplane, okay? And they say the pilot has just passed out. Is there anybody who can fly this plane? I did, somebody just texted and said, this is from the 314, they said, I think it's great that they gave Kerry Davis a chance to call the Cardinals game last night. <laughs> and when I hear some of Kerry's commercials from when he was sick, I feel That's terrible so for him. That's so good. But, hey, winner. Good job. And we love Kerry. He's awesome. But if they said, can anybody fly this plane? I feel like I could have raised my hand and said, I'll do it for nine innings. It's a baseball broadcast. It's not hard. Fly ball caught. It's not a difficult job. How is it that there was nobody that could have stepped in and said, hey, Chip, go home. Chip, go back to the hotel. Sit this one out, bud. And we're going to take it from here. Like, is Chip one of these kind of people who just refuses to give up the booth? He's like, I over my cold, dead hands, you'll take this booth. 
Or was he just like, they were like, no, stay there, Chip. This sounds fantastic on a major broadcast. Like, did nobody jump in? Did nobody say, hey, bud? Like, like you got the cat, right? And the cat eventually came up there and they talked a little bit. And it was BT and the cat and everything. Why couldn't he have just stayed up there the whole game and Chip gone home for the night? Why? Among others. Smoke sure toward right center. Get down mean. ball. It is down. Tatis, a good job to cut it off. Victor on his way to second. The throw is late. Hustle double, Victor Scott. Friend, that was in like the second inning. It I got like, worse. I like the gravel. It, it's like Kathleen Turner was calling the game, but not in a sexy, sultry way. It was in like a, I'm in hospice and it's almost the end way. I don't know. I've always kind of wondered what if the what if the mom from my third grade class who talked like this called a Cardinals game and I got it. And I I thank you, Chip, for that. That sounded experience like experience I wanted I hadn't had yet. The girl when she was possessed by the devil in The Exorcist. I think, I think this what what it is 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 sometimes um, it's okay to 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 pull off on the passion. I you know it's, it's take something you love and you know it's okay to be like you know what. I'm going to pull back a little bit. No, it's okay to just say I'm going to go home. That too. People should. We. I am pro. If you are feeling sick or under the weather, don't come to work. Yeah. Look, and I've been, I've, look, I've been guilty of that. But I talk for 10 seconds in between fog hat songs. So I, it's passable for me. Like, I, like if I'm calling a three-hour baseball game. And by the way, it's not like he just got sick over the course of the game. They open the broadcast and he's like, <laughs> Like, he obviously wasn't there. He couldn't do it. He sounded like Peter Brady going through puberty. Like, you can't do that. Like, someone's got to step in. You know, like, there's that time in life where someone's got to tell grandpa that, you know what? You can't drive anymore. You know, like, that moment, it's not an easy conversation to have, but you're like, grandpa, give me the keys. It's over. You don't drive. Well, or when you do, better example, your drunk friend's like, I'm good to drive, and you're like, Chase, you're not. You can't drive, Chase. It's over. See, for me, it was kind of like the Monstar scene because it, it's like it's like you usually usually you watch Larry Johnson, you know, sky for dunks, and you're like, well, that's fun. This wasn't this was not as it, this wasn't enjoyable. I was you're just, just like, the imposter oh, that looks like Chip Carey. Yeah, I was like, who who took who took our boy out of the back and replaced him? I want Chip. Um, and I never thought I'd say that, but I'd like to hear Chip just when he sounds like normal yes. Chip. And I never thought I'd say that because I'm a Dan guy and I will always be a Dan guy. 636. Y'all are wrong. Clearly an old lady who's been watching the Cardinals for 80 years finally got her chance to call a game from a raffle and you guys are tearing her down. She Andy Dufresne it. She went in there and shut the door and like put it and like locked the door and she's like. Ah. <laughs> I like the idea of just in the middle of a Cardinals game just playing a, uh. a, an opera singer from 1930s Italy. Uh. God, it's so bad. Bless their hearts. Oh, well, it wasn't good. But we won. Listen, you know what? If Chip has to be hoarse for us to go 159 and 3, then... Somebody better start sneaking him cowboy reds. <laughs> yeah, like start gargling glass, brother. Let's go, man. It's working. That's the fascinating part about all the... Like, I don't think there are a lot of broadcasters that sound great anymore because I came up listening to dudes who, when they were, like, towards the end of their career and they were as gravelly and raspy as they ever were. Like, I, I was there at the end of Jack Buck. Mike Sh Mike Shen's, like, my guy. So all that. But these guys today sound true, like too hard to sound polished and they don't really have good pipes. But you know how these guys got good pipes jack buck started smoking when he was three that's how jack buck had those pipes he sold newspapers on the street corners and started smoking three packs a day in kindergarten you say it but i i two of my grandparents smoked a pack a day for almost 80 full years yeah, so did my grandma, and I think she'd be a better play-by-play -play guy than half of these people that do it because she has a distinctive voice. Earlier in the segment, you, you mentioned how she couldn't say uh, Ted DiBiase's name. I yeah. really want to. I really want to know how your grandma would have said Dave DeBusher. Oh, she'd have no chance. <laughs> my grandma, like, she. Uh, it's hard to say because my grandma said a lot of like. She messed up. She was like a Mike Shannon of our house. Just malapropisms and mispronunciations. Uh, by the way, credit to Thanks Dad who finished off our thought and said, to this day, I have no idea what those two Italian ladies were singing about. <laughs> perfect, perfect text from Thanks Dad. Uh, all right. We'll wrap things up after this. It's 101 ESPN.
consider yourself one of Scott's tots? Oh yeah, I'm in. Yeah, we're Scott's I'm tots. One hundred percent. Have you ever met somebody who who enjoys that episode of The Office? Everybody I meet does. My, my brother, my older brother, looked me in the eyes and just says, "That's my favorite episode." And it's terrified me every time that that that, that the human brain can enjoy that that much awkwardness. I have a, a hot take. And it's, I'm not no. a huge office guy. Like, my wife loves it. One of my best friends I always talk about. It. So I started watching some of it just to get the references. But if we're looking at mockumentary TV shows, I prefer Parks and Recreation. Really? It's, Which, not, it's, not, it's not too sickeningly optimistic to you? No. Really? Which I'm is shocked. wild I'm because sure, yeah, I am shocked by that. super pessimistic. <laughs> I, can't, I'm, I cannot believe that. <laughs> but I enjoy it. I All think right. that's a much better show. But it doesn't matter. Hey, look. To each their own. Now, I got a couple things. Um, first of all... Um, let's get the sweep today, and then all of a sudden, like, we're going to the World Series. Opening day is tomorrow. I'm excited. I love going to opening day. I've been to a couple of them, and, uh, and I get emotional at opening day. It all really depends on how much I drink, but if, I'm, if I've drunk just enough to not be angry drunk, but, like, reflective drunk, mm-hmm. let me tell you, man, when the horses start going and here comes the king plays, and I start thinking about how me and my grandpa used to love watching the Cardinals. Now I grew up listening to the games. Like you talked about having the, the game on in the background at the house. That was what it was like being at my grandpa's house. Every room had a separate radio, and every single radio was on the Cardinals game, and the TVs were on the Cardinals game, and they were synced up, radio and TV, before you could just go to an app and sync them up. He had them like, he had like all these little knobs and stuff, so we would listen to Jack Buck, Mike Shannon, while the game was on TV. I don't know if I'm going to go to the game, but tomorrow will be the closest I've ever been to an opening day. You've never gone? I've never gone to an opening day before. Huh. You, you might want to, because I, I bet I, tickets I, are going to be cheap by the time the day rolls around, because it's going to be cold. It's going to be cold, yeah. yeah. It's miserable. So I'm just going to go get drunk and then probably buy some SRO tickets what? and go stand up in that bar. I'm surprised right now. We're getting multiple people who are agreeing, saying the office is tracks, uh, trash, Parks and Recs is way better. And I don't I, think it's I just, trash. I haven't I just, run across that opinion very much in my life. Well, because you've never been with me and my peeps. There it is. These are my peeps right here. So I'm looking forward to opening day because I, I want to get to that perfect level of drunk where I start thinking about my dead grandpa and then cry when Here Comes the King plays and then try not to let people see that I'm crying in the ballpark. It's one of my favorite pastimes. out. I do. I get emotional over weird stuff. A ballpark is the best place to cry in sports. Totally. There's, there's no better stadium for it. Dude, you want to hear the lamest a thing. A rink, kind of cold. It's kind of depressing. you got a jacket, though. You can't yeah. like, hug yourself for warmth. Football, eh. Yeah. Don't, don't cry with football. And, and yeah, soccer, I just don't feel like it. It's too stereotypical. Yeah. Let me tell you. So the weirdest thing that I emote over sports-related-wise, first of all, there's two things, and no one's going to know this reference probably, but there is a video of the 2011, a highlight video of the 2011 Cardinals. It's like a three-minute thing that has Firework by Katy Perry. It's on YouTube. I know this exact video you're talking about. It's like a Fox-produced thing. If I just need to cry... I will put that, if I'm like close, if I'm like, I'm on the precipice of unleashing tears, I'm like, what can I go to? Well, Wind Beneath My Wings is a little trite, so I'm going to go to the Katy Perry 2011 MLB Playoffs highlight package, uh, and yeah. I will cry. The amount of emotion that, that gets for me is, is, is pretty unreal. There's another one on YouTube that also is a 2011 one that makes me cry. And it's the one where they use uh, Some Nights by Fun. Yep. And it says, Some Nights You Win the World. I'm thinking about it, I want to cry. And, like, the, they showed the video of the grandma dancing in the house. I'm like, that was me. Um, so, yeah, my favorite thing about 2011 is I was living in Houston, and my dad was on the phone with me. And uh, this is when Berkman came up, and it looks like we're going to lose. And his TV was, like, two minutes, like, eh, not two minutes, probably 20 seconds ahead of mine. So I just heard him go, oh, my God, it's a hit. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the best moment ever. And I'm a big Lance Berkman guy, so that was great. So there was that. Opening day is tomorrow, and I'm not going to be on, although I'm going to try to ambush other people's broadcasts while I'm hammered. Uh, another thing, and I haven't even gotten into Kansas City. They're not going to lose the Chiefs or the Royals, but it would be so choice if they did. My God, it would. I'd be just, I mean, erect because I hate them. Um, that would be beautiful. I would celebrate. I would dance on their grave just like they danced on our graves. You can go straight to hell, Kansas City. And by the way, you're not going to lose the Royals. Nobody wants them. Kansas City doesn't want the Royals. <laughs> 
You know what, Steve? I almost got a job once in Kansas City. I was talking to a guy about a job about a decade ago in Kansas City at uh, 610 was the station there, the station that Bob Fesco runs now, basically. And uh, they called me when I was in Houston. They're like, would you like to come work here? I said, well, I don't know if that would work because I'm a Cardinals fan, you know. And they're like, so is everybody else here. No one cares about the Royals. And we have the games on the radio and no one cares. Like, I know. So there you go. Uh, so I would love nothing more than to see the Chiefs leave Kansas City. They won't, but it would make me happy. Also, if you'd like to have a good laugh today and you want something that warms your heart, follow Adam Wainwright on Instagram and watch all of his or see his pictures and videos of him getting to go to the studio and make his little country songs. And when you look at him, tell me he doesn't look like a like like a kid that won a contest or like a make a wish kid like he goes into the country music studio everybody else is dressed normally they got like hat like um, baseball hats whatever he walks in like the country music singing guy with a 14 gallon cowboy hat on and a big smile on his face and he's like hey let's go he looks like back to a parks and rec uh, reference that probably no one will get but there's like bo burnham plays a country singer in an episode his name is chip mccap and he has like a song called like uh like, I love my mom, parentheses, support the truth. That's exactly what it is. Okay, whatever it is. So <laughs> that's what Adam Wainwright looks like. In every picture of his, he looks like a guy. He's like, you went to AI, and it's like, I need, find me a douchey country singer, a white douchey wannabe country singer, and Adam Wainwright's picture pops up. Go look at the pictures and tell me I'm wrong. We will reconvene on Friday, and you can all confirm that I'm right. See you later.